welcome to a special edition of Flashback to the Track. It's always special, but this one's even more special because, as always, we're brought to you by Blue Emu. That's right, for maximum strength, pain relief, Blue Emu. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by Mark. And, Mark, we have a special guest joining us. Why don't you introduce him to us tonight? Uh, today we're joined by uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Cody Ware, sports car and NASCAR driver extraordinaire. So... Cody, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely stoked to be here, man. Awesome. So we just, we're all about looking back and we want to look back on different things. Sometimes we review races, things like that, but we want to hear about your time in sports cars, your time in NASCAR. It literally looks like you were just swinging a massive bottle of vodka right there. It's uh, <laughs> essential water for those wondering. Okay. It's not that time of the night just yet. So. Not, not quite. <laughs> so... Looking back on, on your career, like I don't think a lot of people know. They know you from NASCAR, right? A lot of people know that you've run you know, in the Cup Series uh, for your dad's team and some other teams. But people don't know that you have a history of sports car racing. And what you were doing last year and earlier this year before the world got thrown around and we, we're in the situation we live in now. The thing. Before the thing happened. Exactly. Before 2020 happened. And you lived in – or you were working in uh, – in Asia, racing in the Asian Le Mans series, uh, which is a lot of people don't know what that is and and what the cars are and things like that. So we basically want to hear all about it. And let me go back to 2014. So I actually didn't know until I was doing some research. I know we talked in the film the other day that you were the 2014 North America Super Trofeo Rookie of the Year. Did not know that. Yeah. Um, so my early career was actually a lot more mismatched than probably anyone that I can think of that I know personally um, grew up. Uh, my first race ever was actually the legends car at Charlotte motor speedway on the road course. So the winter heat in January normally runs in the off season. So I actually made my start in racing road coursing legend legends cars. And um, from there it was a little bit of your traditional, you know, late model stocks, limited late models, things like that. And then um, about 2014 rolled around and that's when uh, road racing kind of came into the picture and a lot of people don't know that my family has a very long history of road racing to uh, even back as far as my grandfather he raced in trans am back in the 80s racing at places like riverside out in california before that shut down and closed down and uh my father also raced in the grand national series uh, back in the old nascar races at riverside as well and so um, i've always had a big interest in road racing even when i was racing in stock cars because I grew up playing Forza Motorsport, things like that. Um, I've always just been intrigued by sports cars and road racing in general. And so it's always kind of been something that's been, you know, personally, you know, exciting to me. But um, as I started to get a bit older, you know, it seemed like uh, NASCAR racing was where the business and the finances were. And so, you know, when I was younger, I tried to uh, kind of mix the best of both worlds. So I ran about a season of modifieds, a season of late models, and then, 2014 rolls around and I get the opportunity to race Super Trofeo um, with my family's team, Rick Ware Racing, and he was trying to expand. And he's also been a part of road racing in the past. He did uh, the Grand Am Rolex series with uh, Timmy Hill for a few races, drivers like Kevin O'Connell. And so never really a full season, but some one-off deals for like the 24 hour, uh, the Indy road course race when Grand Am went, you know, back, uh, you know, eight, nine years ago. It was and a Mustang, so, right? They ran a Mustang. Yeah. The Mustang car? GT, which was actually basically, I just called it a pseudo stock car. Cause it was, a. Uh, it was basically a two-frame chassis. The guys down at Roush helped us build it, and it had a four-speed gearbox out of a out of a stock car. So it had a a Boss a Boss a 5.0, I think, or whatever the 302 uh, motor was out of a you know Boss Mustang, and then it had a four-speed gearbox and a three-link rear end suspension put into it, and it basically was a a better handling stock car, pretty similar to probably what the the TA1 and TA2 car are these days. And so, uh, yeah, so 2014 rolled around. We ran the uh, 2014 Trofeo season, got to back-to-back overall podium finishes at Watkins Glen, my debut weekend in the series, and uh, picked up some interest from the manufacturer at Lamborghini. And uh, a couple races later at uh, Road Atlanta at the season finale, they actually offered me the position to become one of their young driver development uh, drivers for their program. And so they honored me with the first ever uh, Rookie of the Year for the series. And so, yeah, I definitely think uh, a lot of people don't, don't realize how, how diverse I've been between racing modifieds and late models. And I just, I enjoy it all. You know, I've raced motorcycles between dirt bikes and sport bikes, thousand CC Kawasaki's. And so 
I just love racing. If it can, you know, it's a little cliche, but if it's got wheels and an engine, you know, I'm about it. So. So, I mean, you know, you, you kind of speak to that. You're a racer at heart and you'll, and you'll do anything, you know, what's, what's the, honestly, the weirdest race you've ever been in, you know, whether it could be just a simple competition foot race or, you know, racing lawnmowers or what have you. Actually, uh, the, the weirdest race I ran probably was, uh, it was, it was weird, but also a lot of fun and very competitive was, uh, the UNOH battle at the beach in the modifieds. Yeah. And. I remember going to that track and just we're hanging out, we're pitted on the backstretch outside the track at Daytona and they just have these stacks of tires and like, Hey, here's your race track, figure it out. And I know uh, <laughs> the first practice run, I actually busted a transmission because there's a really bad uh, uh, drainage gate in the track on the infield that's down on the apron. Cause you're, you're not ever racing down there. And I, I bottomed out on it and actually broke the transmission doing that. So basically got like two laps of practice in and had to swap a transmission and I was going right into qualifying and make it in on time. So it was a pretty stressful situation and definitely a weird, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised it didn't run out longer than they did just because it was just such a weird layout for the track. Definitely a, a good spectacle for racing, but definitely a very Bowman gray, you know, beaten and banging esque type of racing they put on there at Daytona. Yeah. I mean, if, if we both recall, um, I think all three of us recall every single race that was won probably in the two years they held those events it was all like uh the last lap dump and run kind of move that basically just yeah. took it away because it was a very flat track it was such a unique thing to have like uh a temporary track basically on the back straightaway at daytona international speedway yeah i mean i was i think it was stefanik that one year where he he got pissed because he just got roughed up by somebody and yeah i i, I think even in the, the late model race the can and late model modified they all had pretty dramatic finishes but it but the track was built for things like that just like bowman gray you're never going to have a uneventful finish at a place like bowman gray uh looking back at um super trofeo uh it's not a series that like i i, I like james have you done any shooting in super trofeo i i haven't because my name's not jamie price so i don't own uh, super um, trofeo, but, you know. I, I have it's actually been a, <laughs> uh, one of the funner practice series um or support series that i'll try to go and, and practice myself if i want to get some shots for my, my series coming up or like look at a location super trofeo just because a the cars are exotic they sound sexy as hell just beautiful and 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 a lot of the drivers are kind of cool because you get some interesting faces in there. Yeah. I mean, like last year we had Chad Reed competing in Super Trofeo, and that's like someone you don't expect to see in that kind of category. But, you know, it's a very diverse kind of uh, series. I I kind of enjoy it. I wish I could follow it more than when I'm just at the track, though. That's what I was going to ask about, Cody, is like kind of being in that paddock. Obviously, there's a mix between like, you know, the older guys, like older gentleman drivers that do it for fun and then some younger guys coming up. And just kind of explain a little bit more about it. Maybe people don't know what it is. Yeah. So if I had to kind of summarize Super Trofeo in that regard, I think it's the when as far as looking at support series, it's the best blend of professional drivers and amateur drivers. So you have a good mix of guys like like James was saying, where there's true professional race car drivers like Corey Lewis, who have made a name coming through the ranks of Squadra Corsa and Lamborghini, building their way to GT3 and becoming a factory driver to where you have serious racers building their brand at that level. But then you also have a lot of guys that are there for fun. And Lamborghini does a really good job building the atmosphere. James, I'm sure you know the uh, hospitality that Super Trofeo puts on is probably one of the best in the IMSA paddock. It's just uh, always phenomenal. You can see it from a mile away. They're big, big black trailer. They have the nice flooring put down the, the just the flags and the tents and everything and they make it really welcoming whether you're a pro or an amateur and they just uh chris ward and all the guys that uh, run the series do a really good job with it and i've always just had great experiences with it and even coming back and just hanging out you know in years past they're always super accommodating and just uh I think they just they have a formula down right where I think, you know, Porsche Cup is definitely something where there's definitely some more of the older gentleman drivers in the series. But it's just such a such a tight, aggressive field that there's not really much room for just, quote unquote, having fun. And I think Super Trofeo really has the blend of enjoying racing, but also being able to take it seriously and professionally. Yeah, and, and, and you kind of speak to both of those series because you mentioned Porsche GT3 Cup. They're, they're both kind of ladder series that have regional 
um, regional divisions within their countries, but also the international divisions. Um, uh, kind of speak to us about like your experience with that ladder system, specifically in Super Trofeo Cup. You know, kind of what opportunities were in front of you as an American driver. You know, exploring international opportunities. Yeah. So when I was first brought on for the development deal, the, uh, the number one thing was obviously the opportunity to go be a part of some testing and developing of the GT3 car. When I ran in 2014, that was right at the cusp of the Huracan GT3 coming out the following years in 15 and 16. And so um, I had a lot of amazing opportunities lined up in front of me. Unfortunately for me, I didn't get to see much of them through due to a lot of the manufacturers. And that's not specific to Lamborghini, but cost is still a major factor in coming through the ranks. It's not like it's a, a free ride all the way through once you have a little bit of success in Trofeo. You know, we had some good racing and we had a lot of good benchmarks. We, we were racing with guys like, you know, Andy Lally and Pierre Klein, who being a lot of, you know, you know, world-class race car drivers there and uh, Super Trofeo here and there. And so it's a good benchmark for yourself and for the manufacturer to see where you're at. But at the end of the day, I was still 18 years old and they're not going to just dump a bunch of money into a kid. But on the flip side, they were uh, just awesome to work with. I got a chance to work with their uh, Lamborghini Esperienza events. So I was doing some driver coaching and instructing for people looking to buy the race cars or potentially just buy the street cars. And we do demos with the street Huracans and things of that nature, Aventadors, whatever they're trying to sell at that point. And so it was really cool to be, you know, brought into the fold like that. And um, I think that for someone that has a little bit of help and backing behind them, it's definitely a really strong way to get um, into professional road racing because I think even to this day that having the chance to race for a manufacturer is the best way to build a long, stable career in road racing. And did you get, so you obviously did like development of GT3 and all that. And, and what, did it open any other doors for you? Cause I know obviously you went to NASCAR pretty close thereafter. I know you raced in Xfinity in 2014 a little bit. So obviously it was that, was that opportunity just not there? Like any other sports car opportunities? Uh, I think there were some. So basically at the end of the 2014 season, we were at a crossroads where, um, actually through some success in IMSA with Lamborghini, I was able to get approved to do some road course races and some short tracks in the nationwide series, now the Xfinity series. And so I started to make that transition transition back into oval racing and stock car racing and was actually relatively fast tracked through the system. We, I think, um, I ran mid Ohio in 2014. And by the end of 2014, I was racing the Talladega truck race. Um, in October. And so it was a very quick progression. In in my personal you know, opinion, I think I was fast tracked a little too quickly. But, you know, at the time, that's just, um, you know, with the way that our business model worked. And when we were racing a nationwide, you know, it just was it made the most sense to get me into a nationwide car full time or as close to full time as possible, where even without a full time sponsor, you know, what could be racing on a semi consistent basis. And me and my father discussed racing in Super Trofeo with the Huracan in the 2015 season. But, you know, I remember me and him sitting down at a cafe and the fear was that, you know, the money just wouldn't be able to see us all the way through at the end of the season. And so I made the decision to focus on the stock car racing because I thought it was a bit more of a stable situation for my career at that moment. Even though it wasn't exactly where my heart was at, that was just the inner racer in me that at the core of it all, I wanted to go racing one way or another. And if it had been going to NASCAR over road racing, that was the, the choice I was willing to make. I and mean, that kind of leads us to the business side of it. Like talk to that a little bit, like the business side of being like a gentleman driver in, in IMSA and what money, like how much money you need to do things compared to how much money you need to do things. in NASCAR. <clears throat> yeah. So I think, um, the, the, the simple, the, the surface level of that is, you know, uh, racing in NASCAR, once you're approved and licensed eligible for, you know, truck Xfinity and cup, uh, the price is astronomically lower than what you would see in IMSA, even at the pilot challenge or GT4 support series levels, because you have prize money to offset 
uh, your expenses. And that's one thing that I think a lot of casual fans might not think about in IMSA because you look at the WEC and Lamar and all these other series, there's not a, a real purse. I know like the 24 hours has a decent purse and a few of the endurance races do, but overall you look at IMSA, you look at, you know, WEC, you look at ELMS and ALMS, there's not really a huge prize pool as far as money goes. You know, F1 is probably one of the few road racing series where there's a very significant purse. And so in NASCAR racing, let's say that, you know, if there was no prize money, it would probably take 30, 40, 50 grand to hop in a truck. But because a team owner is already going there and to start a truck race, might you might make $20,000 to finish, you know, DFL, you know, last place that, um, you know, they can take sponsor dollars or personal dollars at a lot cheaper because they're still going to make money only taking eight, nine or 10 grand because they have an additional 20 to $30,000 on top of that coming from the driver. And so, you know, I look at um, a guy like Josh Balicki, who's a friend of mine, a really good road racer, but he was able to get some good people and good sponsors behind him that might not have had the budget to go GT3 racing or prototype racing, but they were able to just stretch that dollar out a lot in Cup, where he can have a very good career in Cup and Xfinity for, for you know, five, six, ten plus years because the the advertising money is there. More more companies are willing to spend money in NASCAR because you just can't argue the metrics between TV and social media and those things. And so it's definitely ten times easier to not only spend money in NASCAR but to find money in NASCAR. And and you speak to social media, and it's very interesting because um, you know, I mean, we're all still like learning about social media. It's been an ever growing thing for like the last fifteen years, but. Uh, your point specifically, when you started to get into the nationwide series at the time, social media was still a big tool to use for a driver to help allocate sponsors, grow your base, get a network behind you and legions of fans. You know, how did you take that on initially when you started um, and, and, and how did you grow with it, you know, throughout your career and how, how you see use it so far? Yeah, so I was pretty underperforming to, to be to myself um, initially. Um, I'm definitely a pretty, pretty shy and awkward guy. I deal with anxiety a lot. And so a lot of times when I was younger, like 18, 19, 20, I wasn't very good at presenting myself and speaking. And I could do the traditional, you know, post a picture of the car, make it look cool, slap it on social media. But um, some of the, the as, as I got um, bigger sponsors that needed a little more, you know, personal interaction with people, you know, meetings and appearances and things, I struggled with that a bit at first because, I'm, I'm just, at, at, you know, deep inside my shell, I'm just a very reserved, quiet person, um, not so much on social media, but in person, you know, I, I tend to clam up a bit because I just, you know, have issues that I deal with. But um, thankfully, I've learned to deal with most of those. And I feel like I've gotten better as time progressed. And I definitely feel like when I was younger, I could have done a lot more to build a brand. And I was I don't want to say just riding off my family race team, but I definitely could have been doing more if I would have kind of stepped out of my comfort comfort zone more when I was younger. So the other thing I wanted to ask you, well, we got a lot of things we want to ask you, but um, the next thing I'll jump to. So uh, basically, like life as a gentleman driver now, I don't know if you like the term gentleman driver and it makes you sound like an old guy, but like you're a bronze rated driver. Silver. So you're a silver rated Ooh. driver. Even better. Yep. So I can't really call you a gentleman driver then because you don't you don't no. qualify. Uh, <laughs> you're too you're for, too good for, for that. The, you're, you're in what's that, that good trophy media. called that you get? That they give the gentleman driver at the end of the year? I can't. You know, it's like the, the participation award. I know that some of the series have like a bronze bronze championship, a bronze trophy. Yeah. yeah. So, but what's it like trying to obviously as like as an AM driver, like you have to bring money to a ride. It's very difficult to get a ride as a silver driver if you don't have funding. And we'll kind of explain this to people. If you're if you're mostly NASCAR based in IMSA, if you want to race in, you know, either of the two Pro Am classes, LMP2 or GTD, you basically need to be funded. One of the drivers has to be an amateur and the amateur driver has to be funded. And and just how much now of your life is really just like going to business meetings and, and trying to find dollars to do this? Yeah, I'd say the past three or four months have been just uh, building marketing decks, building marketing decks and building more decks and proposals and sponsorship material because, you know, um, 
as I realized pretty quick, you know, going off on my own and trying to put deals together with other race teams is that uh, NASCAR, even if you had a lot of success, which, you know, I didn't have much of, but, you know, it doesn't really translate over to what race teams are looking for in the sports car world. And so I wouldn't call it building a career from scratch, but you're definitely starting from a very foundational level of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, obviously, um, having, you know, some professional experience through NASCAR and things like that's a good thing to have. It shows that you've at least been involved a high level of racing in the past. But, um, you know, the way that I look at it is being a silver driver, obviously being rated as an AM driver, there are, there are ways to take advantage of or manipulate it, however you want to call it the system. And so, you know, I look, I look at uh, Ryan Eversley as a golden example of this, you know, he, he tears apart the, the FIA rating system pretty brutally on social media. He's very open about that. And uh, the super silvers being one of the main, you know, banes of everyone existence is you find a guy that's not really an amateur race car driver, but is extremely fast. And is rated silver. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like hit, man. Hey. so, so the goal for me, obviously, would try to align myself in a way to become one of those guys that doesn't get bumped to a gold if I were to make that professional step in sports car racing and maintain a silver status to where, you know, you're probably not getting a, getting paid to go racing, but you have more to offer when you're a fast guy and you're a silver. And so, I think I'm at a time in my career where if I play my cards right, that, you know, you can kind of, I can kind of extend this period of, of being that amateur driver as long as I can. And, you know, I see guys uh, like Mikkel Jensen, who I raced with a little bit overseas in Asia and was a code, was a driver for the same team that we were working with Euro international who won the uh, LMP three championship in the European Le Mans series. And he's technically rated a silver driver, even though he's contracted by BMW as a factory driver. And so he's, he won the championship. He's won multiple races in GT3 with Intercontinental World Challenge and things like that with factory BMW. But through his very, you know, cautious pickings, he's been able to maintain that silver driver status. And so I think there's ways going forward if I can secure funding for several years that you can I can maybe align myself to be one of those types of drivers. So this is really funny. Did you know that Parker Kligerman is a gold? I did not know that. That's yeah, actually because I was I looking at rankings the other day, and I was like, "Poor guy." <laughs> hey, he's like, "My IMSA career is over." Because there's some Dude, guys, for real. Are, there's some guys yeah. who are silver. I'm like, "Come on, move them up." And then to find out, like, like Austin Cindric's the silver. Like, yeah, but Parker, but Parker Kligerman's a gold. I was just. I think the reason for that is cause I I think when I filled out my application, I saw one of those questions, and they actually classify a win in top three NASCAR as a as a um criteria that would move you up to a gold ranking so if you've won a truck xfinity or cup race you're automatically a gold so he so might I, he might be up to gold then yeah i know yeah, indy lights is like that too i think jerry hillebrand he's like gold too because he won the indy lights title like 10 years ago yeah despite so that, the parker's probably the gold because of winning the truck races so i'd say at talladega but yeah. the, FI, the FIA doesn't. They don't. They don't know that. They just see NASCAR race winner. So bump to gold for Parker. And like he said, that's gonna make it a lot, lot tougher to negotiate something with a sports car team down the road. So speaking of like FIA, and you talked about uh, over in Asia. So I'll ask you about that. So a lot of people might not know that you spent last year racing an Asian Le Mans series um, in the LMP2 AM class, which is a class that's unique to that series, which is only for amateur drivers in LMP2. But LMP2 regular is the top class in that series. So you're racing yep. with like the same car and there's no restrictions on the car, right? It's just the drivers are different. No. So, so they actually they're, they're different generation cars. So the okay. LMP2, this, the only, it wasn't like that in years prior this year, the LMP2 overall was running the current generation prototype, which has a little more horsepower, some more downforce, but yeah, they're basically the same cars. So the Ligier that we were racing in LMP2 AM was a slightly different version of the LMP2 Ligier that was racing in overall, just some some fascia upgrades to the to the front. The tail's a bit different, and they were pumping out probably about 100 more horsepower, but very minute differences. The biggest thing was, like you said, the amateur classification, which is basically you're allowed a maximum of one silver driver, and then you either run one bronze or two bronzes to fill out your car. Okay. So. Yeah, so basically we looked at that from a team perspective of um, obviously it's been a dream of me and my father's to race at Le Mans, you know, for forever. Him, obviously, a lot longer than me. He's been around a lot longer. And, um, 
in every in every class in Asian Le Mans series, you have an opportunity to win an entry to the 24 hour. So if you win your class championship, you have the chance to you know get your entry to compete in in Le Mans for the respective class. And so you know we are looking at it from a budget perspective and. You know, going over to Asia was actually something that was brought to us. Um, the idea was by another guy who was interested in racing in the series, and he brought to our attention kind of how how cheap and how economical the Asian Le Mans series was compared to Europe and the WEC series and things like that. And so we looked at it as a cost-effective way to have a, a decent shot at winning, you know, an entry and a championship into the 24-hour. And so. Obviously, the car count was fairly small. We started off the season with, you know, our two entries, which only one of which actually took the, the green in Shanghai because of shipping issues. But then you had a RLRM Sport and uh, and ARC Bratislava from the Czech Republic or, or uh, Slovakia in slow. And so pretty small field. So we felt like, um, you know, our odds and based on the fact that it was three or four cars total in the class that um, as long as we had some relative success, we'd have the chance to get the championship and personally i was i was stoked because if you would have told me you know four or five years ago i'd have the chance to race an lmp2 car in any division in any category i'd be be high as a kite so something that um you know it was a it was a it was a small class but the the racing was really good you know met a lot of great people the aco and the people that take care of the series are phenomenal and it's an experience that you know i'll remember for the rest of my life you know just getting to race in china and australia thailand and malaysia just uh something that I never would have even dreamed of as a, as a kid racing. And now I have that under my belt. So it's a, it's a small, it's a small thing to win, but I'm still proud of it. And I'm still thankful to have been a part of it. Well, folks, we'll be right back to our interview with Cody Ware and our discussion, but James, you know, NASCAR heat five just came out and the F1 games coming out. And I don't know about you, but I've been playing a lot of video games lately and I never even thought of this, but like my knuckles are hurting and my wrists hurt. I'm just, I'm aching, man. Yeah, you know, Mark, I found the same issue too, because like, I don't know why, when I'm playing like, especially Heat, my hands just get really tense. And other than commenting that by mentally thinking about how tense my hands are, you know, normally what I'll do is after a race, I'll apply some of this maximum arthritis pain relief cream from Blue Emu. Uh, I don't have arthritis. Uh, it's not that serious, but it works really well. Um, it says it's deep penetrating and straight up it does. Cause like you just put it on the surface of your skin and you're feeling it deep in the muscle, uh, long lasting, you know, I could put this on like after a race, 10, 15 minutes later, I'm feeling the relief that lasts for hours, dude. It's great. And you know what the best part? It's odor free, it's oil free, it's not getting all up on my controller, it's not getting everything all slick and oily, and I'm ready to go take on the next online opponent, man. So I'm telling you, you gotta get some of that before F1 2020, cause like, that that game's gonna stress you out. Yeah guys, I'm telling you, if you wanna be at the top of your game for anything, iRacing, all that stuff, get some Blue Emu Maximum Pain Relief Cream. Thank you to our partners at Blue Emu for sponsoring this episode of Flashback to the Track. Now let's get back to our discussion with Cody. And during during your time racing over in Asia, you know, what was your probably your favorite circuit that you were able to compete on? Um, and, and tell us a little bit of some of the differences probably uh, in between like the regions and the circuits. Yeah, so um, easy. My favorite one was definitely uh, the Bend in Australia. So that was a new track for everybody. It just got its FIA certification. They only had ran a couple races with V8 supercars in Australia at that track. And so we were the first international series to run an endurance race on the full 7.7 kilometer racetrack. I always think it's like 5.2 something miles, a very massive racetrack. Anything bigger than Road America to me is a big ass racetrack. And so really, really cool to be there. And just uh, the way the track is laid out is just, um, you know, three very distinct parts where you have this, you know, your traditional, you know, you got your big old long straightaway in sector one, the first part of the track, and then you just have these conjoining kind of, I call them rhythm sections because they're, they're all very high speed corners. There weren't really any low speed parts of the track. You're just constantly on the brink of balancing the downforce and the speed of the car momentum. And it was uh, a track that I really, I've never experienced a track like that. You know, typically you have anywhere you go, you have a high speed section and a low speed section, but it 
the bend is just like one section after another. You're just flowing in and out of these sweeping S's sections, and you're going into another S's section with some some minor breaking zones. But really, it's just you're never going below 130, 140, other than a few very distinct areas. And so it was such a unique track to go to. And then you top in the fact that it was just blistering hot. You know, it was over 100 degrees on race day, and uh, the track conditions were pretty brutal. It was one of the hardest races I've run in a closed cockpit car, but also one of the most fun because it's just uh, such a unique and exciting racetrack. Yeah, I watched that race on. I remember I stayed up to watch it because uh, I got to say, Asian Le Mans series coverage is great. Free race broadcasts on YouTube, like it's awesome. And there was a lot of off-track excursions in that race. Like I remember just seeing, like that was a crazy race. <laughs> it was. Uh, I, yeah. The start of that race was probably one of the most stressful starts of my life. Just, uh, I mean, I think in the first lap, I probably had to avoid four or five cars between P3 cars and P2 cars going off track. I mean, there was some some of the gentleman drivers and some of the the overall P2 cars that I was struggling just to to get around because they were just just off the pace. And so balancing that in a car like that is terrifying because hop in a stock car, you go to Martinsville or Bristol or a road course, and you're like, oh, I beat the body up a little bit. No big deal. It'll get massaged out or get replaced for the next race. But obviously wrecking stuff on a carbon fiber race car is a lot more expensive. And so I was much more worried about tearing, you know, fenders and body pieces off of that thing. And so I've never been as high strung on a start just seeing cars, GT cars and LMP cars colliding. And just, uh, yeah, that, that race was definitely one of the more, brutal attritious races that uh thankfully we came out scot-free on and uh also in that series i was going to ask you just the first race at shanghai i remember i didn't get to watch but i i saw the part way through the race they were talking about how you had to practice a different car to be allowed to run the race because there's issues with your car yeah so there weren't issues with our car what happened was um more or less, the, the and I, I don't know if we'll ever know the full true story, but basically uh, the container which held uh, both of our cars, including some parts for, for Factory Liger, they also packaged in some of their parts support into the same hauler that we were, transporter that we were using for our race team, and it got hung up in Chinese customs. And so we actually didn't even see the race car till the evening before race day. So um, we had the rule in FIA is you have to complete three laps on racetrack to be eligible to compete in the race before before the green flag drops. And so thankfully, the guys over at ARC Bratislava let uh, me and my co-driver take a couple laps to become eligible for the race. Um, and that was done on, I believe, Saturday afternoon and then probably about nine or 10 o'clock at night on Saturday night before race day, we finally got the shipment container in and they thrashed to put the decals on the car, sticker it up and, you know, get it prepped just to take the green flag. So that was the start of the race was our very first laps with that car. Cause we hadn't even seen it till late Saturday night before a Sunday morning race. At what point are you like, what if the car doesn't show up? Like, were you like, was it literally just like, was the stress just like, killing you at that point uh, i probably had about three panic attacks i was calling everyone in my phone book just like losing my mind because i'm like i'm all the way here in china i obviously don't have any control i don't know who i could even call to talk to to solve any problems but um you know uh surreal from the aco and the asian Le Mans series and graham goodwin and a lot of the guys that work with the series did a really good job um taking care of the problem you know we had uh, antonio ferrari who was the team manager for us overseas um Thankfully, everyone was able to come together and finally figure out some things. I still quite don't know how we ended up resolving all the issues. But um, personally, as a driver, I was just terrified and bummed beyond belief, you know, going to bed Friday and Saturday, wondering if we were going to take the green flag on Sunday. So for us to even finish the race in Shanghai without any issues was a, was a win for us, given all the hardships leading up to it. And, and there's something interesting, too, uh, to point out here, because, like, you know, we, we talk about the differences between like sports car racing and NASCAR, like the, the amount of uh, effort the, a group in, in like a, a paddock a team in a sports car paddock just gives thrashing on a car uh, just to, to make the green flag is it is a very interesting thing to see that they'll be up all night just working on the car as long as they can make it to the green flag. I mean, I'm pretty sure your crew had that same mentality, but I'm, there's a, there must have been a lot of stuff to go through. I mean, the engineer had, probably had to be there to, to, to plug in and read the car and then, like you said, stickering up the car. I mean, what 
was that like? Did you get to see like the team effort on, on that front? To, oh, to get yeah, no, it was phenomenal. I mean, I was there with them till probably about one or two o'clock at night. I just helped kind of decal the car up and stick her up. Finally, I had to say I'm going to bed to get some sleep before the race. But I wouldn't be surprised if those guys stayed up all through the night and were still there come come, you know, morning prep time. So it was phenomenal. I mean, we had a a lot of very passionate, fiery Italian crew members from from over in Italy uh, that just did an amazing job on the car. You know, Ferrari just did a really good job um, taking care of the jo- taking care of the team. You know, he brought over all of his race winning crew members from the European Le Mans series. So we had a really good operation. That they just they already have been working together for the whole season. They're coming off a championship. Everyone's in a good mood. Obviously, just a lot of a lot of positivity in our in our garage, and so you know, just seeing the there is no question about it. They're like, we're getting this car on the racetrack. We're racing, and there was in their mind there was no question about it, and that that gave me peace of mind as much as you know I could take. Obviously, I was still internally losing my mind, but just um, you know, seeing in action how willing those guys were to work. You know, like you said, till the sun came up was just uh, really impressive and really kind of put me at ease. And you guys finished on the podium the next day. Yeah, we. The we, elephant uh, in the room, though, <laughs> is there was four cars in that race, and one had mechanical failure. Yeah, so we finished P two out of out of the three that ended up making. So we were dead smack in the middle. But honestly, like I said, given the circumstances, you know, just getting to take my first race in an LMP two car was a really cool deal, and really just is an awesome experience. The Shanghai International Circuit was a beautiful racetrack and my first time at an actual F1 racetrack. So getting to turn laps on that track was something that, you know, very few people can say they've done. Yeah. What's that kind of culture shock like when you go from, you know, tube frame and drape paddocks at Watkins Glen to an FIA grade circuit where the garage is the paddock and you just turn the car and put it in there and go out like what's that like? Yeah, no, I mean, I was joking about it the whole weekend. I mean, after the races, I was just like, I came back to a, to a NASCAR race, and I'm like, all right, we're box, 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 box this time, because I'm just like, the, the whole atmosphere and how things are run are just so different. And it was a lot of fun, you know, having, you know, at Shanghai, they had its own little personal driver room and crew room, so all your gear bags, and you have TVs and tables and chairs set up in all these AC air-conditioned rooms that are literally attached to the garage, so you're never more than 10 feet away from the race car and what's going on. It's so different you know normally go to a place like daytona you have the garages that are all the way over here and then all the way over here might be your rv or wherever your tent or wherever your hauler is set up and you know you're always walking back and forth i mean i know i know there's been some weekends at daytona where i probably walked 10 15 miles you know just between the garage and the other you know xfinity garage and the cup garage and all these different things so having everything compact and clean and put together like that was a really cool experience and like, what was the, the culture shock in general, just the travel, just going to Asia? You know, I've never been to Asia. I've never been to Australia. So what was that like? Just your young guy and you get to go travel all around Southeast Asia. Yeah. So the biggest thing was overcoming the plane flights. So not really one that's scared of flying, but uh, I'm typically, I'm six foot four. So I'm a pretty big guy. So I'm never truly comfortable on a plane flight. And so I was, the the worst part about the travel for me was just, getting comfortable on these 16, 18 hour plane flights. I know that uh, the one from Sydney, Australia back to the States was the worst. I think it was like 18 and a half hours, just a brutal, brutal trip. But um, I mean, the places that I've, I, there's a lot of places that I've always wanted to go to, like Australia has been on my bucket list, uh, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, in between the last two rounds of the series, we stopped in Singapore, got to check out, you know, all the crazy, you know, lifestyles, seeing all the sports cars and all that high end living and all these kind of, you know, Southeast, you know, oceanic countries in Asia. And it was just a really cool experience because I, uh, I'm, I'm a big history nut. I still want to travel more in Europe and see places like Italy and Greece and things. And so I got to knock off a lot of things on my bucket list, just give me a travel to all these cool places. So I think one big thing a lot of people like to do when they travel, obviously, is eat. But I mean, you're also working and you're probably losing about like 10 pounds of, of water it, in a, a stint on race day. So how do you balance your, your life when you're traveling, you know, around internationally, you know, cause you're having fun and you're enjoying it, but also you got to focus on being a race car driver. Yeah. So, I mean, like to, to go back to what the, the food situation was, I mean, I was in heaven. So Asian food, sushi, Japanese, Thai food, that's all like 
my favorite food. So I was in heaven over there. I mean, the the amount of food and the amount of good food I could eat in, in Thailand for the price was phenomenal. I mean, I know even at the gas station, it's just like, I think me and my buddy Daniel, we were driving from Bangkok to Buriram in a little like K truck type stick shift uh, truck, just digging through four hours of the Thailand uh, back countries. And I know we stopped at a gas station. We bought like four bottles of Red Bull, a bunch of bags of chips, just a bunch of junk food. And the total came out to be like, what was the equivalent of like four US dollars. And like back home, that'd be probably a 20 or $30, you know, gas station stop. And we were just like, this is incredible. We can eat all the junk we want for like a fraction of the cost. We get to our hotel, which is like a four star hotel at Bury Ram right next, like literally within a walking distance of the racetrack. And we could have, we had like pad thai, pizza, all this stuff. We had like an American appetizer pizza, but then we had like really good pad thai and beef and pork. And it was like 10, 12 bucks for like, I know my buddy had some drinks. I had my food and I'm like, how can this be this cheap? And so it was like, for me being an Asian food geek, I was just losing my mind. It was just awesome. But um, the big thing for me was sleep. So I, I had a, a really big issue with getting converted over to the time zones. I don't, I don't typically sleep a lot when I'm at home anyways. And so sleep deprivation is a, a big deal for me. And so typically like before race weekends, I was just shut down. I would have my meals and I'd go back to bed for the most part when a day was over, you know? So typically I was getting to the, the countries about a week beforehand. So I'd have two or three days to kind of goof off. So if I was tired, no big deal. And then come the race weekend, I was pretty much up to the racetrack, have my meal and then go back to bed because I just needed all the energy I could get on race weekend. But we got to go to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, see the Petronas Towers and explore the city. You know, same thing with Singapore, you know, the downtown. We went to the Marina Bay Sands, which is that really cool casino hotel right on the water that you see right next to the, the racetrack on the Singapore GP track for F1. And it was just places that are really just like picture perfect scenarios. And so I'm glad that for me, I found a pretty good mix of enjoying the travel, but also taking care of still being a race car driver. And what was I going to, oh God, I feel like an idiot. I had it like right there. And then the food thing threw me for a whirlwind. I was like, wait. <laughs> Sorry no. about my food rant there. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got pretty excited there. Well, I was going to ask no, you, we, so, we, sir, no, uh, go ahead, James. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we have the inside scoop that, uh, like Cody Ware is an Asian food nut, so everyone should be open towards Asian uh, specific food and just Thai food specifically because Thai food's fire. See, I'm not a big Asian food guy, but the, oh, the thing I was going to mention was that the, so you're different as a driver, obviously. Like you actually like don't have as many responsibilities on the weekend of the race. We always joke that while well, the drivers show up five minutes for the race starts, you know, they never have to do anything, you know. But you actually get to like travel around the cities and see stuff. So everyone always asks when James and I will get back from a location, like, oh, how was Dallas? You got to go to the NASCAR race. I'm like, the track and the hotel were great. That was all I saw. <laughs> you know, like, literally, we don't get to see anything interesting ever. So that's I'm really glad that you got to travel and actually see the cities and weren't just flying in for a day and flying back. Because some of these sports car guys, my God, like, um, who's the the big one? Like, your own Bleak and He's in a race in a different country every weekend. And he just flies yeah. in like – or I was at the Rolex this year and we had Shane Van Giesbergen on our team. And he flew that. He flew for the Roar. He flew back to Australia for another test, flew back to Daytona, and then flew back to Australia to do Bathurst the week after that. And I'm like, I don't know how you can, how you can do that. Like that's insane because I, I, I struggle on like a five-hour flight. Yeah, I think a lot of those guys, you know, a lot of these international top-tier, you know, factory drivers, they have – you know, a big, a big plate, you know, to fill. And so I respect those guys a lot because I know how much even a, a four race season kind of mess with my head with, its, with the time differences and the travel, just doing it for a couple months. You know, I can't imagine being in Europe one weekend, Australia the next, North America the following. It's like, you know, very demanding. And I know that uh, I'm sure a lot of those guys that have, you know, wives and kids and families, they probably don't see them a lot during the race, the race weekends, but still it's uh you know, that's why I'm thankful because I know that, uh, you know, on my own dollar, I'm probably not flying to Malaysia, flying to Thailand and all these places. And so, you know, I got to do a lot of things that I've wanted to do that I might not have gotten to do on my own dollar. And so, you know, definitely got to take that and be thankful for it. And was oh, it like sure. being one of the only American drivers in the series? It was interesting, but I think um, 
you know, obviously I'm not too privy to how people are treated in Europe, but uh, my experience with the Asian Le Mans series was incredible. Um, not only from the series, but just the other drivers, um, the, uh, the, the competitors and the people that I met and talked to is a much more laid back atmosphere. The Asian Le Mans series didn't have a, you know, this race, it's every race is the end all be all for them. You know, it was a much more laid back. It's still racing. People are still going for their entry to Le Mans and the championship, but it just, it didn't have a feel anything like I've felt in any, in any garage, you go to the cup garage in NASCAR and like you just, your, your blood pressure and heart rate goes up. The second you walk in there, you can just feel the stress. You can feel the pressure. You can feel what's at stake when you walk in there. But the Asian Le Mans series just has just such a unique atmosphere. And that's why I'm really excited to hopefully go back there to, you know, either, you know, go back for another run in LMP2 AM or potentially in a GT3 or the overall LMP2 class, because what I experienced over there was phenomenal. And I really want to enjoy more of that too. Yeah. We, we talk about that in Insta a lot, how the paddock is really just feels more like a traveling circus. Like everybody's mm -hmm. on the same team. We're all just part of a fun show and we travel together. NASCAR doesn't feel like that. NASCAR feels like we're all not friends and because mm -hmm. there's a lot more money on, on the line, right? There's not just guys showing up and doing it for fun. So it's, it, it's an interesting contrast, but speaking of that, uh, days of thunder jokes, how many did you get when you were over there? Um, being as someone who's racing the Daytona 500, I got more Talladega nights jokes than ah, I did. I, yeah, I, I don't think it. that I don't think that I got any Days of Thunder jokes, and I would have been very impressed if someone would have made a Days of Thunder joke to me. You didn't like, shift, like a, ever like shifting into the extra gear, you know? Right, exactly. The twelve our twelve speed gearboxes or yeah, twelve yeah. speed H pattern. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's, they got. They would have to be a really a movie buff to just pull out like Days of Thunder references. Yeah. I mean, like Talladega Nights was just more more relevant at the time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your favorite though, Talladega Nights or Days of Thunder? Or a different one. You can throw a different yeah. one out there. Yeah. You could. It could be driven for all we can. I mean, I mean, better not be. Driven. I think. I think Stroke Race was a good movie, but uh, I'd say that Talladega Nights. I, I I think is not nearly as bad as some drivers make it out to be. There's some drivers that are like. It's not NASCAR, but it's like it's Will Ferrell. It's funny. Who cares? If it makes more people privy to NASCAR, who cares? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a funny movie. It's not meant to like rip NASCAR. It's just funny. That's all it is. So we there, do have there. some fan questions, Cody. We have a few. Uh, so John Skates very simply just wants to know what your favorite track is that you've raced on. I'd have to say Road Atlanta is probably my favorite racetrack. I just I, I love the area. And just the going down the backstretch and just diving into turns 10A and 10B, it's just a very unique feeling. I just love the elevation change and the speeds of, of Road Atlanta. Just a really cool racetrack. And uh, Scott Boys wants to know, what's your favorite paint scheme or livery in sports cars that you've ever driven? Uh, ooh, that's tough. I've driven a lot of cool cars. That's the thing. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of people know that uh, RWR may not be running at the front every weekend, but we – they've banged out some pretty sweet paint schemes over the years and i'd say my coke 600 paint scheme from last year is probably one of my favorites Sick. the same one you used for the twitter post but then uh another contender would be the uh the ecu car that i drove at dover back in 2017 yep just a really good that that purple and yellow just looked really good on the cup car and uh mike Raphael wants to know what who was your favorite teammate in nascar Ooh, it's let's kind of see. rough to be like to pick one as your favorite. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna be if anyone sees it, I'm definitely gonna get a text message later. No, no one's gonna see it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Man, that's that's actually wow. I'm surprised I wouldn't even have a quick answer. I'd probably have to say, uh, oh man, that is tough. I'm trying to think, there's just so many teammates. You know, RWR. You know, again, a lot of drivers have been through the doors. So I'm just trying to, I'm like going through the mental list of everyone I've raced with. But um, actually, Stanton Barrett's probably one of one of the oh, coolest yes. guys Ooh. that I've raced with. You know, I call him, we call him stunt driver extraordinaire because he's just, yes. you know, he's racing a NASCAR one weekend, then he's off shooting the next John Wick movie or, you know, Batman or who knows. It's really, really cool to know a guy like that. We love Stanton he, Barrett. He's awesome. He is truly stuntman Mike. He's like the there real version of him, <laughs> except he's cool, yeah. and he's all like all husky chocolates. Uh, we always yeah. love Stan Barrett. 
I know that anytime I see a movie where where he, there's a lot of stunts and action, and I'm always waiting for the the stunt actor credits to see if his name pops up in them because he's actually been in a lot of a lot of movies lately. Yeah, I've I've done that too. It's just weird because like you'll like back when we actually could go to the movie theaters, you would do that and you'd sit through the credits, especially during like some of the Marvel films, and just kind of mm-hmm. shocking. He's like in in those too. It's oh like yeah, he's he's everywhere. He was actually, uh, I, I don't know what the technical term for it is, but on John Wick 3, he wasn't a stunt man, but he was one of the stunt directors. I think that's the term that they call it. So he was actually one of the ones helping choreograph and kind of put together the stunts for the for John Wick 3. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's the kind yes. of guy where I'd like to know how many like broken bones he's had. You know, like, mm. is it in the hundreds? Like, you know, as a stunt person? Yeah, man, he'd be like Travis Pastrana level if he was in the hundreds. I would, I'd sure <laughs> yeah. hope not. I mean, he still walks yeah. pretty normal, so I think he's That's not that bad yet. Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to ask you to do, Cody, is kind of compare, like, so you, when you ran that Xfinity race in Mid-Ohio 2014, so compare, like, running there in a Super Trofeo car to, like, a 3,400-pound stock car. And just because a lot of the people think that, like, I remember last year in Mid Ohio, Jack, Jack Hawksworth did the race, and they're like, "Well, he should win. He's from IMSA." It's like, yeah, that's it's not that simple. No, it's um, it's very different driving styles, and that's something that a lot of a lot of us know. But the biggest thing is, and I'll, everyone that's driven both will tell you, is brakes. Uh, you know, in comparison, NASCAR brakes are horrible. The technology of NASCAR brakes is phenomenal. I mean, the way they disperse heat and build all these trick, you know, AP racing and Brembo calibers. They're, they're milling them out to save every ounce and pound they can down to the point where you can literally see the pistons exposed basically on the sides of the calipers that, um, you know, the brakes are very advanced in NASCAR, but you can only slow down a big hunk of steel so fast. You know, you don't have ABS, you don't have assist. And so, you know, what you would be breaking at, you know, you'll look at Watkins Glen's a good example. You're breaking you know, at the six, maybe the five, if you got a good race car and a stock car versus in a G, even in a GT3 with ABS, you're probably breaking at the, the four or three or maybe even the two if you're just, you know, out of your mind. And so it's just a lot different. The, the, um, you approach a corner differently, you throw it in the corner differently. And the weight transfer too is a big one that a lot of people don't think about is, you know, in a stock car, you can't just throw it in the corner and mash the gas pedal and let the traction control save, save the day. Like in a GT3 car, you're, you're waiting to feel that body roll, feel the weight of the rear tires get, you know, the body's going to plant suspension's going to set, get a good drive off the corner where a lot of the GT cars and prototypes, if they're set up good, they're like go-karts. You can kind of point, shoot, mash the gas pedal and go. And so I actually think that there's a lot of finesse that people might not think are in stock cars that are actually there. You know, you look at throttle management because Sonoma is a perfect example. You're in a dry deserty area. There's dust all over the racetrack. If you go out there, like it's a qualifying lap, two laps into the race, your tires are shot. You're spinning the tires off of every corner because you're managing tires. You're managing, you know, you're short shifting to save fuel. You're short shifting to save tires. You're easy on the gas. You're easy on the brakes because if you go into the carousel at Sonoma, you know, balls deep every time, you're going to have a lot of brake fade and, and, and you know, brake, you know, you're gonna lose, your pads are going to overheat. There's just so many variables that you don't even have to worry about in a GT or sports car that are constantly on your mind. You've got axle and wheel hop going into a braking zone too deep in a stock car, which you'd never experience with a with a sports car. And so I think that um, a lot of guys that, that, that can do both are very talented. But um, a big thing that even I've noticed is going back and forth between the two can can be quite difficult. Can we get you a ride for the Daytona road course race? Even like in Dude, Arca I, or something. I'm, yeah, hey, we'll, I'm there. I mean, I'll go drive. I'll go drive a beater. We'll go have some fun. I'm all for it. I mean, you know, I love the road courses in NASCAR because even though I wouldn't call them equalizers, you can have a really good day with with not good equipment. You know, I have, I've had a lot of really good runs with guys like Mike Harmon racing. I love Mike Harmon to death. You know, definitely you know a bit of a controversial figure, but somebody that I respect and, and appreciate a lot. He's let me drive his stuff and I've raced with him a lot over the years. And I know, um, you know, at mid Ohio one year, I think it might've been 17 or 18. We were running top 10 with three to go, uh, before Brandon Jones took us out, but we were running top 15, top 10 all day. And I think that that says something about the road racing and NASCAR is if you have, uh, you know, someone familiar with the car and the track, you know, racing that, uh, a lot of the variables of motor and tires and things like that kind of go out the drain for the NASCAR road course races. And so I'm always down to drive anything and everything 
on a NASCAR road course because you can really uh, take the car further than where it might have been on an oval or something like that. Now you speak too also to like uh, the 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 almost the uh, the parody level kind of that is presented at a road course. It's it's not almost a parody, but it, it's there are a le- there are levels that are kind of evenly played out. But one thing is is attrition, and and always I see it coming down to is aggressive driving. Do you think like NASCAR drivers are just a little more aggressive on the road courses than you would have seen, say like GT drivers and, and LMP2 drivers? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously the biggest reason for that would be the fact that NASCAR has never been one to really penalize for rougher aggressive driving. I mean, even turning someone very rarely, you know, would warrant a penalty from NASCAR. I mean, and so in GT racing, especially in IMSA, maybe more so in the FIA, but you're getting penalized for contact. You know, if it's if it's avoidable, I, I think that's the word is avoidable contact. You know, you get penalized for that. And I think if you penalized every driver in NASCAR for avoidable contact, three quarters of the field would be penalized by the end of a road course race. Because, I mean, you look at the Roval from the past couple of years. I mean, that's that's just it's like a street course blended into a Roval blended into a nightmare because you're just you're going through this super tight shoot through this first part. You're then diving into the backstretch um, bus stop, which we've all seen all the memes and videos of just people taking chunks off other race cars and the banners flying around the track. I mean, it's such a brutal race. And so I don't even think you can compare because the NASCAR drivers definitely are just so more aggressive because they can be. And I think that's one thing that um, I kind of have, have not necessarily used to my advantage, but I'm definitely not as afraid to get close and personal with other some of these other sports car drivers because I'm used to dealing with that guys being up my ass guys being, you know, pushing me to off to the side of the racetrack and things like that that you wouldn't really experience in the sports car world, but they're not going to bully someone that's had experience getting beaten banged on for lap after lap after lap. So is the future for you, Cody sports cars? Yeah. I mean, the, the big thing for me is my, my plan and my goal is sports car racing. I just, um, you know, I've gotten to the point of my life where I'm, I'm too young to be as wigged out and stressed out as I am. And I just want to enjoy what I'm doing at any level. And road racing to me is fun, whether I'm running first or last, I enjoy being in a sports car. I enjoy racing with people. I, I love a lot of the people that I've met in sports car racing, you know, working with guys from, even my days in Super Trofeo, I still have a good relationship with guys that I've worked with and raced with. And it's just uh, a feeling that I've never really felt in, in the NASCAR garage. And a lot of that is just, you know, attributed to how racing in NASCAR is. Go back to that very stressful make or break. You know, people are answering to million dollar sponsors in NASCAR and it's a just a different atmosphere. And I just I don't think me, me personally really have an interest in putting myself through that emotional ringer for for decades i just don't see that being the case and so if i can build a a career where i can get it started by finding some sponsors and building uh you know relationships and career that way then that's great and if not you know i'm going to give it my best shot doing it now with sports cars being the dream what is what is the the ultimate dream that you've always had would that be Le Mans? you know what what is uh the pinnacle in, in in that sports car arena for you for me, it's not even necessarily being at the, the whatever you would consider the highest class. I've always just had a love and a dream for, for GT cars. I love factory-based, I love production-based cars. I love I love GT racing in general, not necessarily GT3, but I just enjoy platforms that come from a production mindset. And so a dream of mine would to, you know, be solidify myself with a manufacturer and be one of the, one of the you know, you know, whatever your Nick Tandy type guys who's racing in Intercontinental GT, IMSA, and he's just the factory guy that gets to go travel the world and, and be a part of whatever programs Porsche has to offer, someone like that, you know? I'd love to be a Patrick Long, too. There you go. Patrick Long. <laughs> Can't forget Patrick. No. He's won some NASCAR races. People forget that. He's won some <laughs> East races and West races, so. Yeah, I uh, actually, I saw, uh, I saw Nick Tandy was tweeting, too, about the Daytona road course. He's... He's he's itching to get into that situation there. So, I think they could all easily get into the ARCA race. I think you could. Oh, for as sure. As long as you don't care if you make any money, I think if you if you're willing to do it for free, I think you could be in an ARCA race, no problem. Now like, here's the thing: I, I see a truck race too. I think you'd be surprised that, that there's there's a lot of places where you can go do some racing for and have some fun in the truck series right now. So, like when when you're saying like have some fun, like you mean like just 
not necessarily just being the field filter, but getting out there, getting that experience and, and making sure that you're not putting yourself in a, like a stressful situation and, and just being able to enjoy the experience. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of teams in the truck series right now that have decent programs that don't really need a whole lot of funding to come with it that you can hop in for free or close to nothing and have a good shot at a good you know top half of the field day and you know for a guy you know that's trying to just say they want to do a nascar race i think that'd be a good opportunity for him and and now you say free but like there's always some kind of strings attached obviously knowing people but uh you know do, do you obviously have to pitch in and and you know get your hands on the car or, or, or equipment or just helping the team with, with loading it on the trailer, you know, you know, what, what other things would you have to, you know, help out for like probably a lot of drivers that are looking at this and saying like, you know, free bring money. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. money, money yeah. solves everything in racing. That's the, uh, that's the definitely obvious. the key factor, but you know, I think it, it's case by case scenario, but yeah, there's definitely teams where you have guys like good example would be like Kyle Weatherman and Bailey Curry at RWR. They, work full time in the shop. They work their asses off day in and day out and they put in their time. And, you know, once in a blue moon, you know, they get the shot to go do some racing when they have the time. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunities like that for anybody that's willing to work hard and and be a part of a team and show that it's not just trying to take advantage of an open seat, but also just be a part of something and have it be a bit bigger than their own selfish interest to drive a race car. And you think that's maybe like you unfairly get put in a group as, you know, who you're, because of who your father is, of like how you, you got to where you are and your rides. Do you think you kind of unfairly get put in that group? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think to say that I'm not advantaged would be, you know, BS, quite frankly. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, you know, I've definitely had to put in my effort where, in times where it's been needed. But, yeah, I mean, I've had to obviously – If I didn't have my father, you know, Rick to help me through my career, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. I mean, most definitely wouldn't be where I'm at. So, you know, I attribute a lot of my success and and my opportunities for him sticking his neck out for me. But on the same token, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't see, which is if I was a complete bonehead, not that I'm not a bonehead, I definitely have had my bonehead moments. But, um, you know, if I was wrecking cars left and right, NASCAR wouldn't approve me to run races like the Daytona 500, you know, there, there are as much as money can buy you races, especially in NASCAR, there are still some things that the series does, does hold sacred. One of those being the 500. And so I've still had to be smart and look at the bigger picture in a lot of situations. And I think that, um, yeah, there's a blend. I'm definitely thankful for the opportunities based on, you know, my family and the race team. But, um, at the same time, You know, that's just part of the territory, you know, Austin Dillon and Ty Dillon probably get a lot of flack too. And it's just part of the territory. You know, we, we get to drive race cars. So there's definitely worse problems to have than people making snarky comments. And there's definitely been a few times where I get a little butthurt, but um, thankfully I've been reeling that back a little bit lately. No, I mean, you know, you can only take so much, um, so much without, you know, you know, without it kind of affecting you either emotionally or personally. Um, but you know something to to that you spoke about it initially about feeling uh, a little stressed about being brought up kind of quickly um, and it's kind of a trend that we see with a lot of drivers uh, they go from trucks Xfinity and they go right into cup and it's about getting that experience and that seat time you know what 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 was really stressful about you in that transition as you got into stock cars and into NASCAR um you know, I'd say the first half of it wasn't bad. Um, at the Xfinity level, even with my massive lack of experience, I was able to stay out of trouble and kind of mind my own business. You know, we obviously had a 15th place at Mid Ohio at my debut, just staying out of trouble. And, you know, we ran on the lead lap all day long. So I was happy with that for my debut, given, you know, the equipment that I was in. But, um, you know, in Xfinity, I was able to, you know, stay out of trouble, collect top 25s and top 20 ish finishes here and there. But, um, where it really kind of hit me hard was at the cup level, you know, making my first cup starts in 2017 after missing my first shot at the cup start in 2016 with premium motorsports. Um, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of pressure for performance, but there was this pressure of, um, I didn't belong com- competition wise. And I knew I didn't belong. And the, the part that was the hardest for me was I knew I wasn't ready for that level, but I didn't really have a choice. It was where the business was and I didn't have my own personal sponsors. And obviously 
the family's race team was focused on cup. And at that point, making the transition, the money to be made and the business model was in the cup series. And so my choices were either pretty much stop racing or, or bite the bullet and go full-time, part-time, full-time, whatever you want to call it, you know, part of the, the cup series program. And so it's, it was really difficult, you know, in 2017, I just, I struggled a lot both on and off the track because it's, you know, it's tough being in the same race as guys like Kyle Bush and Jimmy Johnson, who, you know, obviously I know Jimmy, you know, decent. He's a really nice guy, but obviously Kyle Bush being someone who's very vocal about the inexperience at the cup level. And me and him have actually had a couple on track experiences, which have been somewhat due to, you know, my lack of experience from times. And that's something that I genuinely feel bad about at times because, you know, I know that if given some more seat time and experience, those issues might not have happened. And so it's a really weird position to be in where it's like, I don't really want to be there yet. I've also got all these people on social media, like get out of cup. Why are you here? You should be spending more time in truck and Xfinity. And like, I wish I could just say, Hey, I wish I could, I would love to go back to truck and Xfinity for a couple of years, but I don't really have that opportunity to go write a couple hundred thousand dollar check for a season in Xfinity, even with someone like a, a Johnny Davis or BJ McLeod, someone of that level. I don't even have the money to do something like that. And so, yeah, but again, that's, that's to me, those are problems that, you know, I have, if that's the worst thing I have to complain about, I'm still living a pretty good life, but you know, I definitely would have enjoyed spending more time developing my stock car st skills because there's been times in the past when I've gone and done some late model modified racing and I have a lot of success because, you know, at that level, like I'm, I'm prepared and developed and, and good to go racing, but there's still a lot of things that I just don't have the talent set and the confidence in driving at the level of, of the cup series. And so it's, it's bittersweet, you know, I'm thankful and I, I had a lot of fun doing it, but it was also just an extremely stressful mental situation to be in. Mm. And, you know, I, I can agree with you on one fact. I hate when, like, you have negative things just, like, linger. Like, it could be, like, something that happened five years ago, but, like, you think about it, and it just, like, triggers in your head, and you just you kind of think about it. You're muted, Mark. <laughs> I, got an ex I got my own mute mic, a mute thing on the mic, and, like, my AC is running, and it's loud, so I try and turn it off. Uh, but, yeah, like, it's like when you lie in bed at night, and you're going to bed. And you're like, man, your brain's like, hey, let's remember all the stupid stuff you did when you were in high school. You know, like that's just uh, – I know exactly what you mean, right? So Yeah. But yeah, man, that, that's – at least it speaks to your maturity though that you knew how inexperienced you were and that you weren't, you know, going to be – thinking you were going to be a world beater when you got in there. And you understood that it was going to be very difficult for you in that situation. And, and that's – I think there's a lot of guys in the series that are kind of feeling that right now as well. There's a lot of young guys that we all jokingly are like, man, like why are they out there? Like, but you don't know what their situation is like and what led them to that moment. Like, could be the only opportunity they have. And I'm sorry, right. wouldn't you want to be a professional race car driver? Right. Right. And that's why I, I sympathize with a lot of those guys because a lot of times their sponsors aren't going to sponsor them unless they can be on the side of a cup car. You know, there's mm -hmm. guys, you know, I don't know any, any specifics or any, anyone in particular, but I'm sure there's a lot of guys you know, that would probably like to get more experience and seat time and trucks and Xfinity and things like that. But their sponsors or whoever's backing them are saying, hey, if you can run cup, you should run cup and you should be there. It's like just because you have a cup license doesn't mean you should go hop in a cup car the minute you have the opportunity to because you might not be ready. And I think there's guys that even at the high level aren't ready. I mean, you know, uh, William Byron's a phenomenal, fantastic race car driver, but he's probably the best example of he just moved up quicker than anyone ever th to the cup level. And not only to the cup level, but in one of the most iconic, recognizable cars in the entire field. So it's something where I think the youth movement has gone overkill. I think it's starting to slow down a bit, but you look at the early 2010s and the mid 2010s, and it was just ludicrous the amount of kids they're trying to push through as quick as possible to the top levels of NASCAR. And so I can appreciate and sympathize with a lot of the guys that are probably dealing with a very similar situation. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. We talk about the development driver era, the mid 2000s a lot and how that really, I think, led like everyone always says like, man, we haven't had a like good. None of these guys come in like we talked to Matt Tift about it and we were like, hey, you know, because we were joking with him I'm like, well, well, you suck, Matt. You never won an, X an Xfinity in your first five races. So you're terrible, <laughs> right? Like, have you been on yeah. Twitter? Like, you're awful. And it's like, 
we were so spoiled by like 2005, 2006 when we got like Denny Hamlin, Clint Boyer, all these guys that won right away. And it's like, that's not typical. And also no. they were like 25 when they were rookies. They weren't 17. So mm-hmm. it's just yeah. ridiculous the standards that people put on stuff. Like I, people rag on Twitter about Riley Herbst all the time and Brandon Jones and how they're awful and they should be winning every race. And it's like, Guys, relax a little bit. Like, come on. Like, these are these guys are so young. Yeah, and, and a lot of these manufacturers, they still spend a lot of money, but there's not really, I, I guess, a proper development program, I would call it. You know, I think that there are some programs still in place to help drivers get through, but you don't have like you did back in the early days of Toyota, where there's just going to spend stupid money on engine programs, car programs, spending dumb money on a driver. You know, that just doesn't happen anymore. A lot of times, I think even in the NASCAR circles, there might be some of these development drivers that are probably spending a bit of money to initially get into some of these programs where back in the golden days, people were probably getting paid to be in those positions. Look at a guy like Landon Castle, who's helping develop cars and stuff with Hendrick and a test driver and racing for someone like that. He was getting paid to do those things where I think a guy like that and the current generation might be bringing something to the table to help sweeten the deal to get them in that door. So the whole the whole business model has changed even on the development side of things because I don't think there's the budget or they're spending money elsewhere as far as the manufacturers go. Oh, no, it's true. I mean, you can even, you know, if you follow drivers and if fans follow drivers close enough, you can see the sponsors that tend to follow them up from the trucks and Xfinity series. To your point, that could be that offset that helps them get that ride and helps secure that that placement because you're bringing those dollars with that sponsor. But, you know, so, an interesting point is, you know, Mark and I love the Xfinity and truck series, uh, especially the truck series. It's probably our favorite series. But I mean, yeah, the viewership Cup just is like isn't there. This now to me is like, eh. yeah. <laughs> Xfinity and but trucks is where it's at. It's 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 always great to to the hardcore fans, of course. But to the casual fan, the viewership isn't there. You know, what do you think? You know, uh, from your experience, just seeing how international races are promoted, and from looking at things on the business side, what do you think can be done to help you know bring that viewership up or have those eyeballs on there so that more companies and, and brands want to be associated with drivers in those divisions? Yeah, I mean, I think it really all comes down to um, just it's the it's the ROI, it's the return on investment, and you know, uh, you know, our family always jokes about you know cup series being the 800 pound gorilla it's what everyone looks at and they want to see when uh sponsors and advertisers are looking to be a part of racing you know no one's going to argue the metrics and analytics of what a cup race can offer somebody obviously if you're running 30th or 35th in a cup race maybe not so much but still the point is you're selling a, a, a national live television package that millions of people watch and for a lot of companies that have ad budgets and ad revenue you know there's there is a finite value to for every a thousand people to watch a race there's a there's a dollar value to people seeing those cars on the racetrack and so even for an xfinity or truck race those numbers are significantly smaller compared to the cup field and so uh, you see a lot a lot of times even you'll see a, a sponsor with one driver in trucker xfinity end up moving over to a bigger name driver in the cup series because they're getting they're probably not spending much more but they're getting way more return on their investment you know unless it's a company where a driver has a personal tie or a personal relationship with them uh if it's just a strictly business decision a lot of these companies would be silly to not sponsor a cup car because i think that uh, especially in the back half of the field you know there's a lot of economical cup cars maybe not for the drivers but you know there's teams that can cut really affordable deals where they're getting a lot of good exposure for not a whole lot of money for a national you know television program and so i think that you really have to either start promoting the lower series better but i think they do a really good job i mean you look at the xfinity series twitter and then the social media for those guys is phenomenal i mean they're they're hitting a lot of these younger markets the social media engagement the content they put out it's funny but it's not like over the top like in your face cheesy but it, it's you know they're very very good about how they pump out their social media so i don't want to say get better at social and, and engagement because it's real what they're doing is good but the problem is every time you have to go up against that cup series you know advertising it's you can't justify it. It's just tough. 
Yeah, I think this is a, a unique issue because, like, uh, Mark is a, a very, very big sports fanatic, and he can uh, uh, attest this to, like, you know, AAA and AA, you know, sports where they are never usually on the same platform that where we see NASCAR have the Xfinity and Truck Series on the same platform as the Cup Series. You know, it's it's a little bit different. Right. It's tough. But, Cody, I think we've taken enough of your time. Uh, the last thing i ask you is – what else do you got going on this year? I know things are kind of everyone's living in limbo right now because of the pandemic situation, but do you have anything else going on this year? Anything nailed down? Uh, not a hundred percent yet, but I would say um, not to be surprised if you see me back on the IMSA grid before the season's over. So, well, that's awesome. That's good to hear. And, and what's, what's yeah. the status of, of the Lamar situation? Is that happening or no? Uh, we're, we're just, we're monitoring it closely. The problem is we haven't really had any commitments from the other drivers to, you know, fill the car up. You know, obviously a gentleman driver is not going to want to spend a bunch of money right now. And we don't even know if the race is going to happen. So no one's willing to invest and commit financially and time-wise based on all the restrictions and things that are going on. So the, the situation and all the travel bans that are even happening on a daily basis are really making Le Mans tougher and tougher every day. And so I'm, you know, hoping and praying that it doesn't get wiped out completely because it'd be a shame to, you know, lose our entry and not going to be a part of the, the race. But, um, you know, all things considered, we're just trying to put it together the best we can, given all the crazy circumstances. That's good, man. Just keep well, let's keep your head up. Hopefully everything works out for you, man. And it's good. Like, yeah, obviously I mean, no, go ahead. We're, we're all together. I mean, you know, obviously I'm just one of many drivers dealing with the insanity. Everyone's dealing with it. I mean, you look at people, people are losing their jobs and their lives and livelihoods and families and businesses. So missing out on a race is obviously, you know, tragic, but there's way worse things going on. So just, right now I'm trying to keep a much bigger picture in mind because, you know, I'm still getting to live a dream while people are, you know, struggling for their lives at the moment. So, you know, just trying to look at it from a bigger picture. That's the right perspective right there. That's that's good, man. So thanks so much for joining us again. And a huge thank you to our partners at Blue Emu for helping us out again. <laughs> unbelievable yeah, that, Blue. that we have a sponsorship. Uh, hopefully we're going to get Landon Castle on the podcast soon. I was chatting with him the other day. So we're hoping that we'll uh, be able to talk to him, a fellow Blue Emu guy. So thanks again, Cody. Really appreciate it. And we will see everybody in the next episode. Mm-hmm.